beautiful people, lovers of freedom all over the world. I bring greetings from a grateful heart. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for wherever you might be watching me from. I do appreciate your support always on this channel. I am grateful. In case you are seeing my face for the first time, I am Agatha Progress channel here on YouTube and I come across your way every blessed day. Do well to support Biafra referendum because in Biafra, we shall rejoice together. All right, I have a wonderful video here that I want us to watch together. I don't know how you felt about it, but I do hope you pick some sense from it. Now, here is the video. Watch it, and I will be right back. Members, um, I see the fan crew, a member of the team too. Um, by my right, by left is um, Mr. Bruce Fine. He's um, now become an IPOB uh, lawyer in US and um, also uh, representatives over there. So by my left, by beside him is um, by Samaso Lopala. Uh, Samaso Lopala is also a well known lawyer in Abuja and also across the globe. I'm also a member of our team. Uh, so other ones stand beside us uh, are members of the press. So we welcome you for this um, this uh, press briefing. Uh, title the press briefing on developments in Mazna Mikano's case. Coming up on the 21st day of October 2021. We, the members of Onyendo Mazna Mikano, Kano's legal team, heavily led by my humble self, we shall bring to the attention of the public interesting development in this case. Since our client was abducted in Kenya on the 19th day of June 2021, and consequently extraordinarily rendered to Nigeria, his subsequent secret appearance in court on the 29th day of June 2021, and his non production in court on the 26th day. Of July 2021, as well as what we expect in court on the 21st day of October 2021, that is tomorrow. This press briefing became compelling against the backdrop of the seven counts most screen amended trial filed against our client last week Friday and will also start on us on the same day. After waiting for over advertised and hyped amendment for over three months by the federal government, you may recall that upon the abduction of our client, in Kenya on the 19th day of June 2021 and his extraordinary rendition to Nigeria afterwards. He was secretly brought to court on the 29th day of June 2021 without our knowledge. We, his lawyers, we are not notified of the proceedings of the 26th June 2021. Hence, our unavailable absence. Of course, you notice that day we are not in court. Because we are not told about his uh, being arraigned in court on that day or being taken to court on that day. He was secretly brought to Nigeria and also taken to court without knowledge. So he was secretly brought to court on the 29th day of June without our knowledge, of course. We, his lawyers, we are not notified of the proceedings of, of 29th June 2021, and hence our unavailable attempts. The matter was consequently adjourned to 26th of July 2021 for commencement of hearing on the case. And I know uh, at the point the judgment was still given by the courts, the court made an order. That it should be produced on the, on the 26th day of July 2024 the coming of trial. We, as lawyers, this matter then came up on the 26th day of July 2021 for commencement of hearing in the, in the case. But our client, Tony Dumas and Nani Kano, was not produced in court. Neither was there any plausible convincing reasons for his absence in court given by the prosecution on that day. An action which was in flagrant violation of court order made by his Lordship Honor Justice. Nyaku for him to be brought to court on, the, on that 26th of July 2021. We only we were only told by the by the by the Leonard, the Director of Public Position of the Confederation that they had a um, logistic problem and such they won't they were not go to court. So which reason to believe is laughable indeed. So furthermore, in view of the long adjournment of the case already on record, the decision which we believe may have been informed by the annual court vacation, which commenced during the said period. And in view of the court's disposition to hear the matter during the vacation, we applied to the Honorable Chief Judge of the Federal High Court for issuance of a fiat to enable his lordship to proceed with the hearing of the case during vacation. This application was considered on the merit, and his lordship, Honorable Justice, uh, the Honorable Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, in his own wisdom, consequently granted our application for fiat. This approval for fiat was granted despite the federal government took opposition to the application because they filed opposition to the application objecting to grant of that fiat. The lordship found reasons 
that it is compelling the circumstance of application that that fiat should be granted, and that, that application for that fiat was granted. So, approval of this request by his own chief, Honorable Steve of the Court, was communicated to all parties in the case, including the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation, via the Office of the Director of Public Position of the Federation. Now, despite being served the approval of this for, approval for this for, for the fiat, and shadow courts sitting on the case during the period under reference, the Office of the Director of Public Position deliberately found, neglected, or refused to present any of his representatives to honor the invitation for agreement on a date, the convenient date for the trial to commence on the authority of the fiat, even after several reminders we are served on them. The hard fact we are compelled to swallow today is that despite the approval for fiat being given by the Honorable Chief Judge and the readiness expressed by His Lordship Honorable Justice Sinako, even in the open court, to proceed with the hearing once fiat is granted, the federal government of Nigeria absconded from court throughout this period while they are holding our client in captivity. As the world is now away, tomorrow being the 21st day of October 2021 is the date on record. Collectively agreed up in open court by all parties for the commencement of hearing in our client case. We therefore demand as follows. One, that tomorrow, being the 21st day of October 2021, should be sacrosanct. Our client, Oyendu Mazen our client, Oyendu Mazen must and shall be produced in court for to face his trial tomorrow. Thankfully, the learned director of public position of the Federation has, though belatedly, filed a seven count amended charge along, along with an affidavit of completion of investigation. So there's no excuse or place to hide whatsoever again to justify doing the contract because what, as part of the document they serve on us, are compelling the amended charge, seven count amended charge. They also filed an affidavit of completion of investigation in the matter. So there's no, they cannot now hide under the guise that the matter has been, they've still been investigated on any offense. So the investigation the has been concluded. So tomorrow we're expecting to be in court. And no story, we're not, we're not going to detect any form of excuse whatsoever from, from them. So that's that too, that security agents ostensibly to be deployed to man the court and its environs. Or detail to provide security on this day, being 21st of October 2021, that's tomorrow, should be manifestly civil in their conduct towards the civilian populace who are expected to turn the court in their numbers in solidarity with our client. It is on record today that over 20 persons, all of a indigenous extraction, including a lawyer, who were in court on the 26th of July 2021 to witness the hearing on this case were intercepted and consequently arrested on their way back home at Lokoja by the security agents. Until date, they are still being held in various station facilities of Nigerian security agents without access to their lawyers and their family members because they were caught only to witness proceedings of the system. Like, unfortunately, the matter didn't go on because they were not, our client were not, not produced in court on this day. They are still returned to be returned today without giving us access to them without even giving the family members access to them. Though we have commenced legal action in court against security formation still detaining them in their various detention facilities. This indeed shows how low the state can go in gross violation of citizen rights without this, without, without this infraction being accounted for. But they are sure that justice will prevail for this to dehumanize citizens in the end because we must see to it. We are not leaving any stone on top to ensure that the infraction on their rights is challenged effectively in court. It is, therefore, to be noted that court premises, particularly the courtroom, is not a barrack or police station where rules of engagement is are treated with liberty and people subjected to all forms of inhuman treatment. It is not. We wish to note very strongly that the atmosphere of fear, molestation, Intimidation, harassment of civilians in and around the court premises should be necessary. As many foreign observers have arrived in the country to witness this important trial of a political prisoner, 
Of course, you know our colleague who, here, who is from US, is one of the leading attorneys in the United States of America. He's a well-known person, and also uh, if you make inquiries about him, you know about more about him. I mean, he's fine. So we may have to talk to him in the course of time. So he's here also to see things himself, and also be part of the proceedings of tomorrow. So I pray that they will come tomorrow to do the to to to, to be his nail, so so that the international community will also be. We wish to remind the security agents that it was in a period such as this in 2015, 2016, respectively, that citizens who merely came out in their numbers for show of solidarity with our client on the day he was brought to court were massacred in their numbers at Ingwa National High School, Aba, at the state. Also, at our front hall on the church, on the health bridge, and we said in Amara Rambo Street. This, this has been reported by Amnesty International, reputable foreign 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 organization, about the killings of unarmed civilians on the day he was brought to court. I was not there in Abuja when this thing happened. The people were killed, people that came out to show solidarity with their client to pray for his release. They are gone down, killed by Brazilians and just security agents on record. And the world has those information with them today. So we do not want a repeat of such ugly God incident. But telling now that people have, have chosen to remain indoors to stay in that line. We also wish to state that the current current tension and regular on the facts will be observed by our people in the South East. Despite their style being called off by our client's peaceful movement, steadily gaining momentum because our client, because our people are yet to be seen. And believe that our client was a woman in America was still alive. Because had it been the producing cause of this of the line, the matter was scheduled to, to, to go on, it would have been a different thing altogether. So they, they believe that we are not giving them fully the good information. They are not telling them the truth because they, they want to see him. I want to see him hella happy. I want to see him alive. I want to see him released. We also wish to state that, it, that, they, that it, okay, the suspicion was further fuel. By his non production in court on the 26th of July 2021, for no tangible reason, our people's demand for non production release from custody is a well informed wish, which the government of the state at the center currently is persecuting Mazina the country, give a list of them to and speedily activate the process towards his face. Attending court in solidarity with our client. The world is watching. The show of shame openly demonstrated by the Obazilos security agents on 26 July 2021 should never repeat itself. We demand for justice, fair hearing, fair trial, and fair play, which not, will not only be done in open court, but manifestly be seen to have been done by an average person. Washing from close proximity. On this note, arrest, molestation, rough handling, maltreatment of harmless civilians and sympathizers who are to be in court in show of solidarity should not be allowed. We also wish to advise our client supporters to bear in mind that not everybody will be, will be able to assess the court courtroom on this day. Hence, wherever you find yourself within the court's environment, you must remain civil in your conduct, as you have always been, and continue to supplicate to God Almighty, even as the trial goes on. Furthermore, that our objection to the competence, or otherwise, of the newly amended seven count charge is not before the court. And we believe most strongly that there shall be light at the end of the tunnel, because uh, we are on the firm conviction, the team of sophisticated lawyers are on the firm conviction that there is nothing before the court. To have the court come into charge and it cannot stand. We thank you all for being part of this briefing while providing you, promising you all that victory shall be ours and justice shall prevail in the end. Thank you all and remember it. With love from all of us in the Lego team, we say welcome and remember it. Thank you so much. Finally, finally, the four day council to end the matter in Ghana until the 20th of October 2021. Thank you so much and remember it. You're welcome.
Thank you for that wonderful welcome. First, I'd like to send my greetings to all the people of Nigeria. I've been treated with um, unexcelled hospitality and generosity. So I want to express those sentiments uh, that I feel welcome uh, from the United States. Before I arrived in Abuja, I spent some time in Geneva, where there's the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. It's a five-member group that's a unit of the United Nations Human Rights Council. And it entertains applications on behalf of persons who have been arbitrarily detained under international law. Uh, I submitted an urgent action application on behalf of Nandutani identifying all of the elements of arbitrariness in his current detention, including, for example, his denial of access to counsel, which is triggered the moment he is detained. And so you all heard from me before that he was denied counsel even when he was first brought into court. But that's not the only denial. singled out because of his ethnicity, his membership in the African community, which is a discrimination prohibited specifically under international law and indeed also under the Nigerian constitution. If you read the counts in the complaint, now seven, they come at the 11th hour, uh, which is quite irregular. Ordinarily, you accuse someone before a few days before trial. They consist of activities that are commonplace for all sorts of Nigerians. And why is Nandikana the only one charged with such extravagant crimes as treason, levying war against Nigeria? Uh, but in addition to those violations of international law, uh, the fact that he was kidnapped, he was tortured, <laughs> also illustrative of the arbitrariness of his and you can think of the irregularity by contemplating the following at the time that he was delivered from Kenya to Nigeria he had not even been charged with four of the seven counts that are now laid against him that were not advanced and articulated until last week he couldn't possibly have been extradited even for legal means under the urgent action process in the working group, the Nigerian foreign minister was immediately notified of the allegations in our complaint. Uh, in an ordinary case, there's 60 day response time, but because there's a jeopardy to Nambikani's health, including the lack of access to professional medical care, it's on a fast track. Uh, if the foreign minister responds, and at present he is not, then I will be permitted an opportunity to answer. But the working group is endowed with authority to make final definitive pronouncements on international law. And the Nigerian government is a signatory to the critical documents, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Universal Declaration of, <coughs> of Human Rights, which bind the government of Nigeria to adherence. Uh, and a pronouncement by the working group of arbitrary detention uh, would be a critical weakness in the, in the movement for even a trial for someone who has been illegally captured and delivered. It is a fundamental principle, a universal principle, 
of law, domestic and international, that the government should not be able to profit from its own wrongdoing or criminality. And if you permit governments to kidnap and torture and then try persons illegally, you're then emboldening governments uh, to serve as kind of vigilante justice running around all the world, capturing any of their dissidents with no due process and bringing them back to trial. After I completed my work in Geneva, then I traveled to Athens. Uh, I am working with the foreign ministries of Greece and Israel, I didn't get to Israel because of some glitch in COVID-19, but I hope to travel there after this Abuja visit terminates, uh, to sue the government of Nigeria in the International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice is like the International Criminal Court. The International Court of Justice only entertains suits between nations. Uh, most recently, in a case very similar to the one concerning Nigeria, uh, the Gambia sued Myanmar in the International Court of Justice for genocide against the Rohingya, and they won early court battles. Uh, so the nations bringing suit don't necessarily have to be the ones suffering from the wrongdoing. Uh, and the International Court of Justice has a history of trying genocide cases uh, stemming <clears throat> back to the wars that erupted after Yugoslavia disintegrated, uh, Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina. Uh, you know, there are nine year terms for 15 members of the High Court uh, that sits in the International Court of Justice, but we think this is important to have a platform that exposes the daily horrors and atrocities that are inflicted on peaceful civilians uh, in the Southeast. Uh, I want to underscore that this issue of the upheavals and strife in Nigeria are not intended to um, point one group against another. The idea is to make everybody better off. There's not enmity, there shouldn't be enmity between the Fulani, the Biafrans, the Aruba. We can work towards a process where everybody in the long run benefits. And I think one of the models that can be utilized uh, in terms of peaceful way in which to reorganize <coughs> the Nigerian dispensation that benefits all is Czechoslovakia. After the Cold War ended, they had the Czechs and Slovaks were all under one umbrella, Czechoslovakia. But they decided they simply had different histories, different ethoses, and they needed to separate peacefully, which they did, separated the assets and the liabilities and whatever. So there's no reason why there has to be violence, even if there has a change in the structure of Nigeria. And I want to conclude by welcoming everyone who's in attendance here and just the wonderful legal team that Nandi Tani has put together. I'm proud to be a part. Can you move this over? So informed you earlier, and I'm special counsel to Martin and the Colonel and the indigenous people of the Afra, and proudly so. Well, um, the issues are clear. Uh, there has been this, I believe, something we can call a propaganda or consistent misinformation. That back in 2017, Mazin and the Kano jumped bail, and therefore he deserved what he got. That's wrong. He never jumped bail. He was on bail and bond, subsisting, extant, and valid as of 10th September to 14th September 2017, when the E-fetal military attacks were launched against him. Unjust, unjustifiably so. And anybody that uh, really um, saw the magnitude of that attack would agree that it was directed primarily at one thing, extrajudicial elimination of Martin Nandekano. Now, if you're free on bond, 
There is no law that requires you to sit like a, a lot of wood while someone is levying attacks on you. And these attacks came from the complainant herself, the Federal Republic of Nigeria. You already had him under your jurisdiction. He was before court of competent jurisdiction and he was out on bail. So what do you expect him to do in the face of those lethal attacks? He was going to, of course, look for ways of fleeing from the attack considering the fact that he didn't possess any weapons or any military armaments to repel or defend himself, the next natural thing for him to do as a human being uh, who is guided by the law of self-preservation was to move away from the locale of the attack. And that's what he did. And there's nothing wrong with that. So having not succeeded in extrajudicially killing him in 2017, then pursued him to Kenya in hot pursuit. See, this, these are the issues. They have to be clear. You pursued him from Isiama Afaruku Ibe in Abia State to Kenya. And when he got him in Kenya, instead of giving him his rights under the Kenyan law and under international law, you renditioned him in an extraordinary way. Extraordinary rendition is inherently a form of torture. It is prohibited within the framework of municipal and international laws. And those international laws, Nigeria is a state party. Nigeria herself has an extradition act. If you rendition somebody from the Federal Republic of Nigeria to a foreign nation, you've broken the laws of the Federation of Nigeria. And that is why America, that has an interest in having other care, will be brought to the United States to answer to some charges applied to the Nigerian government to approve his extradition. So the question is, why didn't the Nigerian government do likewise with the Nandekano? What is that special feature that drove Nigerian government to the eyes of breaking her own laws, the laws of Kenya and international law? So that is the question. And that question has to be resolved before a Nigerian court. Before he can get to his trial, we have to resolve the question of how did he get here? Did he get here under due process of law or he didn't? The facts are clear, of course. They have been made clear in the objections that the new council filed. And those facts were made clear in the originating action I brought before the Abia State High Court. Questions. So these are issues before you, so that before anybody prejudges and begins to look at him as some sort of a fugitive that deserved what he got. No, an international fugitive also has some rights, and that right can be found in any national law. So what they could have done that would have made all these things would have been unnecessary would have been to subject him to due process of law in Kenya the due process law of extradition. And when you do, the Kenyan court will test whether the reasons for his extradition met the political uh, offense exception or was caught up with it or was barred by it. So, but when you don't do that and you resort to the act of extraordinary rendition, you have created insurmountable barriers to prosecution of the person you Rendered. I can understand the confusion or a little, a little bit of lack of understanding amongst Nigerians on this very concept of extraordinary rendition. But let me look, use just one small example to explain it to you because it's an issue of first impression to this country. In 1984, Nigeria tried to do extraordinary rendition of Omar Odiko. He fell. They put him in a crate. He fell. And what happened? Britain took very strong countervailing measures. Britain severe diplomatic relations with Nigeria for two years. 17 persons were arrested and four were convicted and they served between six to eight years of hard, hard labor imprisonment in the UK. The Nigerian aircraft that was the vehicle for the rendition was seized. The pilot was arrested and detained and too many other things happened. People were deported, left front and center. So if 
Tico's rendition, attempted rendition, drew the eye of the British government and condemnation of the war. the war was his own, is successful. And Nico was a mere resident of the United Kingdom. Nandekano is a citizen of the United Kingdom. And he had a history of standing by to face his trial. That standing by, that readiness for his trial was not broken by him. It was broken by the prosecutor himself, who turned around and renditioned him later. You cannot profit from your own wrong. So even though this type of thing has not happened before, in Nigeria to the point of bringing it before the judicial authorities. It has happened now. So it's between before the judicial authorities to make a ruling on it one way or the other. But I can tell you that our theory, our position will prevail. Thank you. Are you asking about the lawsuit that we brought against the Secretary of State Tony Blinken and the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin? Yeah, it's, about, it's about the one we just fired at them. Oh, oh right. the one, the I filed, yes. Well, what's the status of that case? Um, we filed the complaint. Basically, the background is we think it's very clear that because of the government of Nigeria's fear uh, of losing, uh, certainly the battle in public opinion of their maltreatment of the diasporans uh, and IPOP, that uh, the government paid a purported professor at the University of Baltimore to write this polemic against IPOP. It really is quite amateur. It accuses the Africans of taking machetes and chopping children's heads off, burying them in graves. There's nothing specific about the, the, uh, the incidents at all. It's just all very large numbers, 344% increase of attacks on security personnel, no place, no time, no names, nothing. And as a consequence of this tirade, which was urging the Secretary of State in the United States to list IPOB as a terrorist organization, which is absurd, because among other things, you have to be threatening the security interests of the United States. As far as I know, no Biafran has ever set a, a glove on any American, um, that, uh, that we then have brought a defamation suit. It's a 21-count defamation suit for the attempt to ruin the reputation of IPOB in the United States, not only against the author, who seems to be a Moroccan who worked in Buhari's campaign under David Axelrod earlier in 2015, but against his employer, the University of Baltimore, which we suspect received money from the government of Nigeria in order to permit this professor to identify himself with the government. And also, we suspect that the Washington Times, which was the newspaper organ that published this article, of had being paid off in some way or other to publish something that clearly would not meet journalistic standards under any ordinary test. One of the reasons why we're fortified in that belief is that immediately after the article was published, I wrote a letter to the editor pointing out all the multiple misstatements in the article. I received immediately a response from the Washington Times, and I've read through them for a long time, saying, we will publish your letter the next day. And I sent that, I think, I think to Egypt for it. Yeah. This is ready. Well, it didn't get appear the next day. It hasn't appeared ever since. It seems quite clear that somebody upstairs in the Washington Times was getting paid off 
a, a favor because the article that we have challenged is defamatory. It's, it's amateur. It is not journalistically um, professional. So why would the Washington Times risk its brand, its status as a newspaper by publishing this unless they got a payoff? So we filed this <coughs> yesterday. I got the summons. The summons is something that requires you to serve the defendant so they know they have 21 days to respond or there'll be a default judgment. So we're in the 21 day period now uh, because we've now filed and got the summons on the way to distribute the, the complaint. So that's where that stands at present. I don't know if I last for me. In the going of 5D6, did you make any monetary demand for damages? The, the, the way the way in which you typically in the United States plead, um, oftentimes uh, we just say damages according to proof at trial, because until you that, and sometimes in a situation of defamation, oftentimes the injury occurs in the form of people who don't talk to you anymore. They don't show up on your doorstep, so it's hard to prove something directly that doesn't happen, right? Uh, but we did ask for. Uh, 50, in gross, $50 million in damages, because we think this is punitive damages as well. Punitive damages are things that are given not because of harm to you, but because the defendant acted out of ill will or spite. They had no redeeming purpose. Then just to try to punish and to deter repetition, you can get punitive damages, which oftentimes are 20, 30 times what your compensatory damages are. So anyway, that's, that's out there. I, I have no doubt that the Washington Times says libel and liability insurance, defamation insurance. Uh, the individual, I'm sure, doesn't. The University of Baltimore may, uh, but that's where it stands right now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alison. Thank you. Thank you. In this brief conference, this is what we are expecting tomorrow and it is better that the lawyer has come out to put the word on notice so that there will not be any excuse for his excellency mazina dikan not to appear in court on that very day tomorrow is going to be mind-blowing and god in his infinite mercy will make the victory be so fast as never before justice will be saved and tomorrow they will see the reason and know why the son of biafra need to be set free all hail biafra all right my wonderful family i just want to let you know that tomorrow stay tuned to this channel because we are bringing it for you back to back Thank you very much once again for your love and support. I really do appreciate. Please do want to share this video with your friends and family so that they know the latest and the step to take tomorrow in Abuja. Thank you very much once again. I still remain your one and only Agatha Progress any day, anytime. For now, see you when I see you. Bye.